Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened once or twice. I remember um, speaking not too long ago, uh, I'd say mid mid uh, year last year, I, I didn't even think I could preach that morning. I had not much of a voice left, uh, but uh, came down the home stretch. You can push one last note out, right? <laughs> okay, uh, give me one moment. Something just came to my mind. While I write it down, I want you to turn to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Okay. Matthew 6, I'm going to continue our Bible lesson, Bible teaching on determine what is valuable. Now, I will make this statement. The Bible already has determined what is valuable. Will you determine, will you allow the Bible to determine it for you? Uh, it has been determined. Now we just must, uh, because the Bible has given us, fr- or God has given us free will to decide, to choose. We also have to get in uh, lockstep with what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Lay not, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither uh, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Heavenly Father, help us to find out what the Bible says is valuable. Put all our stock, uh, Lord, I know this is not probably the right term to use, but all our chips on that. Uh, and um, uh, all the gambles we take in life, we should just put it all on the Bible. If we say that uh, we, we have faith, if we've had enough faith to trust Christ um, as our Savior, to, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, then Lord, let's, let's just trust you enough uh, to, to determine what you say is the truth and then to live by it. Uh, Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In quick review, uh, last week we said we are instructed in the Bible to lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, It it, it instructs us right here. It says, lay not up on earth. Lay not up for your treasures on earth, but but in heaven. Now, what is a treasure? A treasure is something that is valuable. A treasure is something that is valuable. My sister Jessie and I, uh, when we lived on Elmwood Street, we would... um, take things and bury them in the yard uh, out by a tree. And there probably may be some stuff still buried by a tree over in that neighborhood. Um, And I remember uh, as kids, you don't really have a decent reference on time at the age of seven uh, and eight years old and whatnot. But um, uh, we would take things and bury them. And I remember we left something down in there for a year or two. uh, And one day we dug it all out. Uh, Time capsule types of stuff, you know, and um, there's all kinds of things on television about buried treasure. I think one is called like Pirate Island or something. Now, I don't really get into it because I feel like it's that reality TV stuff is usually all scripted and it's a joke anyway, um, unless it's real life scenario type of stuff. But uh, And by the way, I, I, I never watched that show, but I think they actually found something on Pirate Island. Um, uh, but uh, these guys, you know, mining for gold. and all, What are they looking for? They're looking for treasure. Treasure, that big boom uh, with, with the gold rush where people just, man, they flooded the West Coast uh, with mining and mining and mining and mining. Um, uh, their Denver NBA team is called the Denver Nuggets. You say, well, that's a silly name. Oh, well, they're named after the Golden Nuggets, amen. That's what they're named after, um, not chicken nuggets. But, um, uh, uh, but they're named after the golden, you know, golden Nuggets. And that gold, what is it? That's treasure. That's valuable, valuable. It's some, what is treasure? Treasure is something that has value. So from this uh, a scripture that Jesus gives us here, we can understand that there are two kinds of treasures. Just from this alone, two kinds of treasures. Number one, there's temporal treasures. Temporal treasures, treasures that that uh, that pass away, treasures that age, treasures that 
rust gets to, treasures that dust gets to, that time gets to. And, and if you leave something long enough, uh, uh, nature will reclaim it. If we don't keep the weeds away, if we don't trim the bushes, nature will reclaim this property. You, you may not know it, but if you left it alone long enough, this place could become a forest because, tre because nature will reclaim it. Um, uh, it'd be filled with dust and, and must and soil and animals would make their homes in here again and people would break in and spray paint on the walls and people would steal the things that they thought had some sort of use or value. So it's temporary. The things that we have on this earth are temporary. But then Jesus says there's a second type of treasure. There's an eternal one. There's an eternal one where it doesn't uh, uh, collect uh, dust, where moth does not eat up and, and rust does not corrupt it and, and thieves don't break through and steal it. So with that in mind, we have to understand two treasures. And then I made a statement last week. The, the statement it was that God is the appraiser and the Bible is the appraisal book. God is the appraiser and the Bible is the appraisal book. Now, the Word of God appraises everything in our life. It appraises your marriage. It appraises child rearing. It appraises finance. It appraises health. and well, it, it appraises everything in life. It gives it a value. Uh, one specific topic was the soul, the value of a soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, what can a man give God for his eternal soul? Uh, and then we got into uh, uh, the story of the man who, who had a great harvest, great harvest, plentiful. He had a, a, a wonderful harvest, and he said, man, oh man, what am I going to do with all this? He tore down his old barns and built up new barns and said, I'm going to store it away. He said, I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to take it easy. Uh, I'm going to, I don't have to work as hard next year or the year after. Maybe I'll take some time off. Maybe I'll hire some people just to manage the land, but I'm going to take my time now that I've struck it rich. So he says, I've got all these things. I've done all these things. This is in Luke chapter 12. But you get to Luke chapter 12, verse oh, uh, 16, and it begins to tell the story, but you get to verse 20. So here this man is, great harvest, and he fills up his barn, stocks it full, you know, got to squeeze the door closed and pin it closed. Oh man, all right, I got it all, I'm good to go. But verse 20 says, but God said, but God said. So we can say all, anything we want about our values. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at my career. Look at how validated I am. Look at my car. Look how validated I am. Look at my cars. Look how validated I am and, and, and the, 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 uh, the, the clothes that I wear, the car that I drive, the home that I live in, the, the, the side of town that I live on, uh, the, the, career, the career that I have, the diploma that I've earned, uh, the intellect of which I, uh, of, uh, with, with, with which I speak. Uh, not me. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Look at, uh, look at me, look at this, look, 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 look. Look what I have done. But God said, but God said unto him, thou fool. Now listen, this man wasn't a fool because he had a great harvest. And this man wasn't a fool because he built new barns. He was a fool because of why he built new barns. Nothing wrong with new barns. Nothing wrong with a new house, new car, new clothes. Nothing wrong with a new career, nothing wrong with a new, but it's with which you place, where, where you place it. And he said, I have to build new barns to keep it all. You can't keep it all. Um, Jeremiah, uh, no, excuse me, Song of Solomon, or not Song of Solomon, S King Solomon speaks of it when he said um, uh, in Ecclesiastes, the, the, basically the meaning and the purpose of life. He goes on and on and on through several chapters saying, you are going to die, someone is going to take it, and they're going to die, and whatever's left over from them, they're going to take it, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. You can't keep any of it. You can't keep it. You can't keep it. So when, it, when we get the right understanding, when we say, I'm going to keep it, we have that same mentality as the man in Luke 12, but we need to remember, but God said, but God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose things shall those be, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Is not rich toward God. I've always been a little interested 
uh, 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 just because it, it seems to be uh, a, uh, a Pacific Ocean of, of information, which I mean in its vast um, enormity, uh, the stock market, the stock exchange, understanding all the abbreviations and the under the bull market, the bear market, and playing the long game and the short penny stocks and all. Oh man, there's just so much information, so much, and to and to really sit down and learn it would take a, a it'd be full time. It's not something you just sit down and play with on the weekend and and you know pick up a newspaper in the morning on your way to your nine to five and you strike it rich. I, but it's always been something that, and I'm not saying that nobody has. People have gotten you know lucky in that sense, but um, uh, and and have learned. But um, uh, uh, I've always been intrigued about understanding that. But but the thing that I, I, I'm more interested in is how do, how do I how does a man become rich toward God? How do I become rich toward God? And I got to tell you, folks, it's, there's more to it than three to thrive, read Bible and pray every day, and go tell people. Now, that's a good foundation. That's a, you're off to a really great start. If you're going to church three times a week, and I, I, I'm not making any excuses for anybody or giving anybody outs, but I understand schedules and work, and I, I get that. But if you're able to make it to church two and three times a week, and you're able to tell people about Jesus, and you're able to read and study your Bible, and 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 tithe, and go knock on, or and and um, uh, uh, and, and be involved in a ministry. Those are that's a great start. That, that's wonderful. But there's so much more to it in becoming rich toward God. There's a lot of self denial in there. There's a lot of um. Uh, there's a lot of being hurt with no reality, retaliation in there. There's a lot of forgiveness in there. There's a lot of um, righteous anger involved. There's so much involved in, in, in being rich toward God. And you'll, you'll never know your account. You'll never know it. And you say, well, man, that's kind of, you know, I kind of want to look at the account sometimes. No, um, the only account that you have to know of is the old account was large and growing every day for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. That's the only account that I am ever aware of. So the, the besides besides knowing how much of a sinner I was and he saved me, it's no longer uh, uh, I want to live for God because I may know my 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 richness toward God. No, it's I want to lay that off and be the new man and live toward God because he died. He sent his son Jesus to die for me and paid my sin debt. So I want to live a new life for him. That's whether I become rich in heaven and have a mansion in heaven or not. Uh, and there have been there have been songs written. You know, just give me a, uh, just give me a, a, a cottage, or give me a shack out on the hilltop in glory somewhere. And okay, I'm, I'm down. I, I get that. Um, but uh, if we can, if the Bible just, Jesus just said it. The fool, this kind of fool, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. So how does one become rich toward God? Here it is. Find out what God thinks is valuable, and invest your time and talent and and treasure into those things. That's, that's how you become rich toward God. But God said, so if we're going to have a balanced life, if we're going to live life with purpose, with joy, with meaning, with contentment, with prosperity, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to learn what is valuable to God and not what is just valuable in life. Uh, so uh, last week I, I, I told you um, to ponder on, and, and it probably slipped your mind because Repetition is the key to learning. And if you didn't hear me say it all week, then it probably wasn't on your mind at all. But right now, you could do an evaluation. If we took a couple of moments and ask yourself, where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my time? Do you spend your time on eternal things or temporal things? I got to tell you, uh, uh, and you might be in a place where I am similarly right now. My mind is transfixed on eternal things and how to figure things out to get my physical uh, path of life into to gear to those to those eternal things. Right now, uh, I'm I'm spread out in several places. I have to fuel these physical things, these temporal things. Got to work a job and pay bills and upkeep things and and um, uh, you know buy the essentials of life, so to speak. But you have to ask yourself: Do I spend time on eternal things or temporal things? Now, if, if you're not carnal, 
uh, you're going to get busy. Uh, you're go- you will get busy doing all the temporal things that have no lasting value. You will get frustrated with yourself in your relationship with God. You will come to a place now, if you're not of a carnal mind, you're going to spend time doing temporal things. It's just a part of living, but you'll get frustrated. You'll say, man, there's more to life. I can do more. I know that I can. I, I can do more for God, and-, and I want to do more for God. And you'll find frustration because the reason why is because you're, you're, you're doing the things that have, or excuse me, you're not doing the things that have eternal value, and that frustration is going to affect you. It, it happens for everybody. Uh, you want to do right. Paul talked about, about th- that war that's in him, about, man, I want to do right, but the flesh doesn't allow me. In the mind, I serve Christ, but in the flesh, I serve you know, sin, and I don't want to do that, and I'm trying to do right. Well, it's frustrating for a Christian who's not given over to a, um, a, a carnal mindset where we have not um, quenched the Holy Spirit. Um, I can tell you I've grieved the Holy Spirit plenty of times, uh, but uh, and, and I, I may have even quenched him before in the past um, uh, at different times in my life. But uh, with repentance, with confession and repentance and forsaking things, you can get right with God. Um, uh, and that's I'll say this. It may take a lifetime. It may take a really long time to backslide as far as you as, as far as you've backslidden. But it only takes one step. One step to turn around and begin to get right with God. Now, you got a lot to make up for, or excuse me, not to make up for, but a lot of ground to cover uh, and, and, and some bad habits to break in, in, in the coming days. But uh, between you and God, it just takes a, dear God, forgive me. Dear God, forgive me. Uh, so, so you'll get frustrated with your relationship with God if you live for the world and just put on church and put on religion. So uh, God controls the inside. God controls the inside. If we let him, Nebuchadnezzar, um, there's a story of him not being able to sleep at night. He could not sleep. Uh, do you want to know why, Houston? Why do you think he couldn't sleep? But you don't have to guess. Uh, if you, just, I want you to say no. Say no, Dad. I don't know why. Okay, good. Uh, he couldn't sleep because God troubled him. God troubled him in his sleep. You say, man, I can't sleep. Why can't I sleep? You know, God might be troubling you. God might be trying to say, hey, why don't you, you didn't talk to me today. Come talk to me today. Yeah, but God, I went to church. Yeah, but did you talk to him? The preacher did all the praying. The Sunday school teacher did all the praying. Well, uh, uh, your, your wife did all the singing. Your kids did all the singing. You didn't talk to me. You didn't walk with me. You didn't worship me today. But Nebuchadnezzar, he couldn't sleep because God wouldn't let him sleep. The Bible says that he troubled him in his, he troubled his sleep. Now, uh, uh, if you would put on your, as Brother Dr. Paul Hazy would say, put on your thinking caps, strap them on, put your thinking caps on and think with me right now. Um, I'd like to be able to go to sleep tonight. And I know that you would too. I don't like tossing and turning. I don't like um, uh, the sleepless nights. And man, you got a, 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 you got a, a dozen things on your mind or more. Um, you're worried about the grandkids, you're worried about the kids, you're worried about the bills, you're worried about the house, you're worried about the car, uh, you're worried about the future, you're worried about your pension, you're worried about 401k, you're worried about much. There's all kinds of things to be worried about, all kinds of things. I like to be able to go to sleep. Um, Now, here's the great thing about sleep. I know that if I have been faithful to my responsibilities to Christ, now, if I know that I have worked hard, I've put in the time, I've put in the diligence, I've put in the effort, I've paid attention, I did a good job, and I know that I took care of my responsibilities, I go to sleep a little easier. The Bible says that the Lord gives his beloved sleep. It also says that, um, that the sleep of a laboring man, of a man who works, or a woman for that matter, um, uh, but if a man or the person who works, the sleep of that person is sweet. It's sweet. And if you work for the Lord, you can do it with a clean conscience. I didn't say clear. I said clean because there's a difference. A clean conscience, and you did it for the Lord, and you did the best that you could, you sleep a lot better. Those who spend their lives trying to um, gain material things, uh, uh, material possessions, um, the possessions of life, uh, they often can't sleep. They often can't enjoy them. And they don't do it because um, they have a fear that someone's going to steal it, to take it, to uh, uh, 
to uh, scratch it, to dent it, to harm it, to maim it. No, we, we, the Bible teaches that as principle, and, and so does life, that the more you have, the more you have to pay attention to. The more you have, the more you need to buy security cameras and locks and uh, guard dogs and guns and to protect those things, to protect your borders. That's what we all do in life is we so uh, maniacally build up our, our, the hedges and the, the borders of our life and our material. And we say, okay, this is my little kingdom. And then we do everything we can to protect it. Why? Because thieves break through and steal. Animals seem to make holes in your roof. Uh, 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 the fences break down and, and rot over the years and, and uh, uh, things happen to the stuff that we have. And what does it do? It takes a lot of attention. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of attention. It takes a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, and it pulls away from what? It pulls away from peace. And the, some, the other thing that we voluntarily give up is sleep. We voluntarily give it up. You say, I don't voluntarily give up my sleep. I w Folks, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We can't have our cake and eat it too. You're going to either have it or eat it. You can't do both. And living in America, we have the definition of, well, we'll just buy another cake. I'll eat it and buy another one. I'll eat it and buy another one. You can't have best of both worlds. Wouldn't it be nice to lay up treasures on earth and work our whole lives for stuff on earth and still earn stuff for heaven and be able to protect it and have sweet sleep? That'd be fantastic. That would be fantastic. That'd be so wonderful. But what's, what's so great about heaven if I can have heavenly peace here? I can have a peace or a part of heavenly peace now, by simply obeying the Bible and trying to become rich toward God. You see, um, we have been trying to arrange things uh, in, in, in our family life, uh, home-wise and work-wise and vehicle-wise and all these different ways. And here I am looking and saying, budget, what can we do? Maximize budget. What can we do budget-wise? What can we do this? So I said, you know what? No, look, I'm pushing everything on pause. I'm doing it. Lord, lead us to the place you want us to have. Lord, give us the things that you want us to have. It doesn't mean I'm not going to keep an ear out or keep an eye out. Because if I've actively prayed and I believe that God will answer my prayer and he's going to do it, I'm going to miss it if I just close my eyes and close my ears and don't pay attention to it. I don't want to miss any blessings. Uh, and neither do you. Uh, but instead of saying, well, how can I, and what, and writing, I can't tell you how many, how much time I've I'll say wasted, but how much time I've spent um, looking and uh, playing mental chess with my life, with the life that God has given me. As Pastor Jackson just said this morning, God's just asking for a penny out of every dollar or a 10 cents out of every dollar. Come on, man. Here, I'll give you, I mean, and you said, I've never, I mean, that, I'll give you the breath in your lungs. I'll give you all the functions that you have. I'll give you all this stuff. And if a company came to me and gave me such a sweet deal like that, of course I'd sign on. Sign up, sign on. I'm signing on with God right now today. That's the deal? He only wants this much? Come on now, yes, absolutely. Uh, but um, uh, it's not my life, it's his. Well, and that's, that goes with, if you know your Bible at all, and, and, and you know that's a given. But uh, uh, we, we work so hard. To build up our little kingdom, it takes so much energy to manage it. I, I've heard it been said, and, and some of you would be familiar with this, addition by subtraction. Addition by subtraction. It's just, what do you, uh, okay, let's say uh, you, you kind of, um, uh, you dwindle down. You, 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 you bring things down. Okay, you have um, a bunch of kids in the house. They all grow up. They get married. They move away. You say, you know what? We don't need this big old house anymore. Let's, let's downsize. That keeps the kids from moving in again. Um, uh, <laughs> you have a big old, you have a big old uh, 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 van or SUV or a sprinter van or a bus to haul all those kids around. You're like, you know what? We don't need this anymore. We can downsize. We can get that sports car that we've always wanted. We can get that coupe convertible that we've always wanted. Hey, yeah, we got a coupe convertible right over here. Uh, uh, but um, go, take Valentine and go on a cruise where they're out in the country, you know. Uh, but um, uh, you, you say we can downsize. We can downsize. We can downsize. And what are you adding to subtraction? 
You're adding quality of your life. You're adding peace. You're adding gas efficiency, amen. You're adding lower energy bills. You're adding lower uh, carbon footprint. Uh, you're adding all these low, these this less stress because you don't have to make sure uh, 18 windows in the house are closed anymore. You gotta make sure eight are closed. You don't have to make sure that the side door and the back door and the front door are locked. You just gotta make sure the front door and the back door are locked. You don't have to, uh, uh, you, you don't have to, you know what, this is such a big vehicle, I've always got to park at the end of the parking lot. Now you can move up close. It's addition by subtraction. And that goes in so many, I know those are, so, those are simple illustrations, but it goes into the deep caverns of meaning of our life uh, in, in, every, in every area. So it doesn't mean uh, this, this addition by subtraction, this living your life um, uh, for material things uh, instead of a uh, uh, eternal things, um, you, you, like I said, you have to manage life. We live in uh, modern day uh, America. God knows where we live. He knows the obstacles that we face. He knows the challenges that we face. Um, and uh, you're, you're not bad because you bought um, uh, Charmin instead of Kroger brand toilet paper, okay? It's, I mean, come on, that's we gotta, if we got to spend some extra dough on some material things, make it count. Uh, but um, uh, there are far too many Christians. We are wasting our lives on uh, playing games and, uh, uh, and, and wandering and changing from job to job to job, trying to find your foothold in life. As I said last Sunday, uh, it doesn't matter where you work or what you, where you currently reside or work or what you do. If you do it for the Lord, the Lord will open the door to all the promotions that you need. So many Christians are trying so hard to jockey around um, uh, with the world and with, and, and, and with uh, uh, secular people and teachings to get their foothold in life and say, okay, this is my niche. This is my lane in life. This is what I'm going to do to be an effective individual here on earth. Um, uh, I'm all for that last part, an effective individual on earth. But you have to ask yourself, am I, am I an effective individual on earth for earth or am I an effective individual on earth for heaven? Where is, where is my effectiveness going? Is it going up or is it just kind of going out? Is it going up or is it going out? Now, um, we jump from job to job to job and we make decisions all the time. We say, uh, this is it. This is the job. This is the lane. This is where I'm supposed to be. I had that not too long ago. I thought, and dad, you know, Jamie, you know, um, uh, where I said, this is the perfect situation. It couldn't be any better. And it was like, God opened a door. I was like, man, this is great. Just a, a couple of years ago now, as I, um, um, uh, was coming off a of shoulder surgery and this job called me and said, hey, we'll give you the schedule you want. We'll give you X amount per run and you tell me the days that you need off and that'll be it. Oh, yeah, hallelujah, man, this is great. The church is on an upward trajectory. I'm gonna be able to spend four days a week as a full-time bad. This is gonna be great. And it just went, <laughs> within like seven months. I thought, what in the world? This is it, I said. God said, but God said. <laughs> and then, you know, you come along and you say, this is it, and, but God said. So I've learned no longer to say this is it, unless it has to do fully and completely with his word. When it comes to the life of Jake Jackson, uh, uh, the, Jake Jackson the husband, Jake Jackson the father, Jake Jackson um, uh, the, the employee, the, the, the person, the citizen, the human, anything is, anything can change. Not wives, not kids. Uh, but, but I mean, situational wise, uh, uh, things can change. But when I open up the book and I read something in the book, the book says to me, Jake, this is it. This is it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is it. If my people which are called by my name, this is it. You see, God's word is it. Not the life of Jake Jackson. So since the life of Jake Jackson and the life of humans are so um, inconsistent and they vary from day to day and time to time and year to year, 
What we need to do is we need to attach our something, attach our lives to something that is it. That makes my life worth something, not by the world's estimation. You know, I don't, it doesn't matter if I ever became a, 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 a famous preacher or you became a famous whatever in your field. Famous! Just because the world says you're famous doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. It means very little. Well, the whole world is watching. Well, I sure hope you use that platform to tell somebody about Jesus. You know, there's a, a, a boxer now. I don't know his complete background. I saw, an, this is the only reason why I even knew about him. Heavyweight guy, years before I even watched him on TV. His name was Tyson Fury. And a man came up to him, uh, uh, and he's from uh, Great Britain. Uh, a Europe, or I believe, uh, somewhere in Europe. Uh, he's got a British accent, so I'm going to say he's a Brit. Uh, do what? England. So the, a man came up to him, and I believe he was at home, and um, uh, in a car there, and somebody came up to him with a microphone and said, hey, you know, this is what they're saying, and uh, blah, 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 blah. And he said, his response was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord. And he's sitting in a car, and he's got his, 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 um, his group with him, you know, his, uh, his uh, what do they call that? His posse with him, you know, his, his, press, his PR guy and all those. And he's sitting there, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be. He, he, he said, sir, and, and Mr. Fury, if you, know, if you could respond to your, you know, your critics, what would you say? He said, Jesus loves me, and he loves you too, and he loves everybody. Hey, have anybody, has anybody seen that? If you're familiar, Dad, you've seen that? Houston, you've seen that? You got Tyson Fury. Um, uh, interview uh, Jesus, uh, not interview with Jesus, but interview, uh, when he's speaking, Jesus loves you, Jesus saves you, Jesus, you know, that's fantastic. You got a great big platform, use it for the Lord. But if the just because the world tells you you're something doesn't mean anything. He is something and that's all that matters and let him one day say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, uh, just as I said, this is it. This is the place I have arrived. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And uh, 10 days later, we've all heard those people. We might have been those people before. 10 days later, 10 months later, we're doing the same thing all over again. We're looking for another job, looking for another career, not finding a placement or a foothold. Now, this, this doesn't mean that you're not going to change job, jobs during your life. I've done it. Anybody ever had a job change or a career change before? Yep, yep. Those of you who haven't, you're liars. Uh, but um, uh, God, <laughs> God, I don't believe God blesses job hopping. God wants to see, just like, a, just like a, a loan officer wants to see longevity on your, uh, uh, on your resume or, uh, or, or on your uh, loan application, the Lord blesses longevity. It's not that he wants to see it, it's that he blesses it. God looks down and says, man, I know you've got a crummy employer, and I know that job doesn't pay exactly what you, and by the way, I'm not saying if you found in the market that we live in, I'm not saying if you find a better job, don't go for it. Um, but the Bible says that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and a loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, some people, man, they pick away and pick away and pick away and pick away trying to find that diamond mine. And they get discouraged and they quit one yard short. One yard short, they turn around and leave. And a lot of people do that at their job. You didn't know it, but God's been working on your, your, on your place of business and your employer for months and months and months and months and months. You had no idea about it. You just went to work and you worked hard and you did what's right and you kept a good testimony. You showed up on time. You didn't clock out early. You didn't call in sick all the time. You did what you were supposed to do and God was preparing a blessing for you, but you quit and you got discouraged and you walked out walking on your bottom lip and sucking your thumb with a poor, sour attitude because you just couldn't take it anymore. Anymore. I guarantee you, people who do that don't have a powerful prayer life. People who do that don't have a real walk and talk with the Lord. Because if you did, I guarantee you the Lord would give you the peace that passes the understanding of, of uh, the way that you feel to be able to have longevity and continue in your place of business to make it through. And God will promote you. And God will do for you the things that he said he would do if you hold up your end of the bargain. In a good name, it's your testimony. It's your testimony. Don't, don't just flake out and flail out every time. We've had, man, I, I can't tell you how many times there, through the pallet shop, through truck driving, through drywall, through, through uh, uh, a, a church uh, uh, 
uh, church act, and I don't mean activities, but church um, uh, things that needed to be done at the church, church construction, church uh, weighing carpet and put painting and all kinds of where people, you're dependent on them. You think they're going to show up and then they don't. Well, I just didn't pay enough or I just didn't want to. Man, come on now. No, the, uh, that goes into that a just man swear through his own hurt and changeth not. Just goes to show you're not a just man. Show up and do what you said you'd do. Um, uh, and God blesses, God blesses people who say, these are the principles of the Bible and I'm going to obey them the best that I can come hell or high water. I'm a do or die, do or die, victory or death. I will see it through one way or another. I don't care if I have to paint the wall 15 times. Now the church treasurer says, yeah, we can't afford that. Uh, but, uh, but you say, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to see it through. So sometimes a pastor, it's just, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. Everything's great. I feel that way sometimes like, man, this, this is great. We're going to do it. <laughs> and then there are times that are not so great where you're like, man, this is not great. We're not going to do it. You say, what is that? That's called uh, spiritual warfare. That's what that's called. Just the pastor goes through it. And so do you. So you have to ask yourself, where do you spend your time? Where are you spending your time? You're spending, a, you're spending your time building a life only for it to die? And you can't take any of it with you? Or are you spending your life, and I'm not saying live in the smallest house and drive the smallest car, and, and not like um, uh, Cortez and, and um, uh, who's Mr. Internet? What's his name? The guy who said he invented the Internet, ran for, for president. Al Gore, Al Gore, I, I said almost ran for pastor. Uh, he might have won, uh, but um, Al Gore, uh, <laughs> these people want you to have these small, you know, um, what is the society uh, where you have nothing and you'll be happy. Uh, I'm not saying that type of mindset. God bless it, this is America. Big guns, big cars, big houses, and big boots, amen. Uh, Brother Alex, you wear boots. Brother Jerry, Drew, he wears boots. Uh, but um, uh, we, where we do it, at, you know, uh, Texas wants to claim every, everything's big in Texas. And that's American right there. That's um, Amer big steaks, big glasses of sweet tea, amen, big, big everything. Um, but um, uh, I'm not saying you got to downsize your life to please the Lord. I'm saying you got to put him number one. That's it. Just put him number one. God, what would you have me to do? Number one, and uh, uh, I'll take just time. I won't jump to the next one or anything, but number one, number one, obedience to principle takes time. You can't just hear a principle and, and start obeying it. You gotta know what it's about. What is this principle? What is it? It, need, it has to be taught. Taught. Now, I like things that I hear and go, ooh, I like that, and then who said that? Oh, Adolf Hitler said that? Never mind. It just, that doesn't sound good after all. It actually sounds pretty bad. Uh, you know, he could say, the sky is blue this morning. And we're all like, no, it's not, you know. Uh, we don't want to associate with that guy in any way, shape, or form. But um, uh, uh, living by principle, living by principle. See, that's what I want every single church member here to develop, is living by principle, not by pressure. Not by pressure. Brother Angel, I don't want you to change a light bulb because you were pressured into it. I want you to do it because you believe in what this place is about. I don't want you to, and Brother Alex, I don't want you to give not one more Ethernet wire, not one more battery, not one more uh, uh, mouse pad, not one anything, not anything, because you think I want you to. I want you to do it because you think the Lord wants you to. See, when you do it because you believe the Lord wants you to it, that's good pressure. That's fine. And by the way, you ought to have pressures in life. You ought to have pulpit pressure, pastor pressure. Uh, kids, you ought to have parent pressure. Where it becomes dangerous is peer pressure. And if you can't evaluate your peers, which is your roughly your age group given a few years here and there, uh, 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 given or taken a few years, can I look at my peers and go, those are godly people or those people that they seem to be on the right track and I'm going to allow them to pressure me because I believe they're on the right track. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with pressure. Diamonds come out of pressure, amen. There's nothing wrong with pressure. It's where that pressure is coming from. So here's the thing. When you don't know, is this good pressure, bad pressure? What kind of pressure is this? You always, your, 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 um, your fallback, your, what you rely on, 
The, the ace up your sleeve is something called principle. If it does not line up with my, if this pressure does not line up with my, excuse me, not a fallback, a guideline. This is my guideline. And if this pressure that comes out of left field does not line up with my principle, then it is a bad pressure. This is a wrong pressure. And I'm not going to allow it to move me. So live by principle, not pressure. Now, principles are based upon things that are valuable in life. A principle, ethics, integrity, moral. Um, uh, obedience to principle takes time. Now, uh, 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 cold turkey. People are cold turkey kind of people. They can quit things and start things cold turkey. Uh, I said, uh, I told somebody, I'm not a cold turkey kind of guy. I'm a warm turkey with brown gravy <laughs> kind of guy, you know. Um, uh, I'm not a cold turkey kind of guy. I can't just uh, just start something. I want to know that. I want to know some Baxter. Give me some. Give me some meat on that bone. What's that principle about? What is that all about? What, let, let me. I want to hear the, the 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 matter of the whole thing. I want to hear what it's about. Now, as you grow as a Christian, you get engaged, you start getting your feet wet, so to speak. You start wading in the kiddie pool of, of Christianity, and uh, uh, you're looking at everybody on the deep end going, man, those people are just absolutely flat out living by faith. You'll understand, come full circle, the same, the same faith that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ with is the same faith that it takes just to believe in the principles of the Bible. When you come across something in the Bible and you're like, oh man, that's God said it, that settles it. Yeah, it does, but then you have to ask yourself, in the valley of decision, will I or won't I? Will I or won't I? And I'll tell you right now, you'll be a half-blessed Christian if you're a half-obedient Christian. You'll be half-blessed. God will say, man, I don't, is he going to or isn't going to? Is he going to obey it or isn't she going to obey it? So obedience to the Bible takes, takes time. It takes time to follow the principles of God in some of the major areas of our life. Now, as you get older and you add more to your life, there was once a time where I was just a son. I was a brother, and there were principles to that. There was a son, and there were principles to that. I was a student and a steward, and there were principles to that. I, was a, I worked in, the, in ministries. There was principles to those things. But as I got older, I got, I, I got married. I was married, and I became principles to that. And I had children, and there were principles to that. And I said, hey, life's not too difficult. Let me become a pastor. Life's not hard enough. Life's, yeah, life's been a breeze so far. Let me become a pastor. And guess what? There are principles to that. But not just a pastor who's just going to maintain the status quo. I, I want to, Lord, let's do something. I want to do something. And I think God's on the move. And, and, and man, he's moving slow. But man, he's, he, I think he's on the move. And I think God's going to do things. And Lord, let's, let's, let's revive. Amen. Let's, let's start this bad boy up and let's go. I want to be a successful pastor. I want to be a pastor who makes a difference. There's principles to that. You see, there are principles to success, not just to being a pastor, but to being a successful pastor. It's a successful one. And the standard is high. The standard is high. And I don't look at myself and go, ah, I'm, I'm cut out for this. I can do this. Oh, God picked the right guy. <laughs> Dear God in heaven, please guide me. Please lead me. Please show me. I'm a dummy. Would you, Lord, I'm in the classroom wearing the dunce hat, you know? I'm, I'm, up, I'm the one on the side writing, writing sentences. Um, you know, that, Lord, that's me. Why'd you pick me? Um, uh, uh, and not resentful, but... Um, uh, God can use anybody. God can, can do any of that. But um, uh, there are principles that apply to, to all the areas of our life, all of them. Uh, it takes time to walk with God. You can't, I don't think anybody has ever just fallen on their knees and had like the most, the just completely mature prayer life. No, it has to mature. Mature is an aging process. It takes time to mature in your walk with God. Um, there are, I've been with people before who, who go to bookstores and um, uh, they look for devotional books and they don't even read their Bible. Well, this is a really nice devotional book. Look how it lays out how I can pray. No. No. The principle to a walk with God 
is by w- w- walking with God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This book right here is God manifest in his words. He gave it to us. It's him right here are his words to us, God's words written to man right here. But I'm going to go to the bookstore and buy a devotional book about God's book. Nothing wrong with devotionals, but if you're putting the cart before the horse, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. Um, uh, so, so uh, uh, don't, don't look for a way to cut corners in Christianity. The long way is the right way. The long way is the right way. It takes time to rear rear children. I'm telling you what, I can't believe it. I I, I had an epiphany this afternoon. I almost, it's like I was transported back in time where I became my father and I was looking at me where I said, how many times do I have to tell you? (laughs) I'm not kidding. How many times uh, does a parent have to walk out and say, be quiet? I can't tell you, it, it was maybe once or twice. Well, it would have to be at least once. When I was a kid, it was once or twice, and by the grace of God, it was three times. There was no fourth time or fifth time. When Dad walked out and said, shh, we froze. When We don't know for how long. It could have been days, weeks, months. We didn't know. We froze in time until Dad came and said, what are you guys doing? You told us to be quiet. Oh, well, I just meant like, you know, quiet down. I didn't mean freeze in your spot, you know. But we, I didn't chance it. We didn't, and that wasn't because dad was a, 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 a well, sort of, a tyrant. He'd, rah, you know, leap out of the walls and, you know, just devour the children. But it was, man, be quiet. How many times do I have to tell you to pick that up? How many times do I, Houston got out of the shower yesterday, left the wet towels on the floor. Did you take a shower? Yes, sir. Just look into the bathroom. I don't even have to tell him. You know, to a credit to Houston, I don't usually have to explain something to him. Lucas, I have to explain it to him. Like, I didn't, he wants to get all philosophical. Eh, I didn't build it. No. Houston takes a shower, gets out of the shower, leaves the towels on the floor, hang them up, dude, so they can dry out. And I, Houston, walked, Houston, did you take a shower? Yes, sir. And all I do is look at him, look at the bathroom, look at him. And his face goes from... And he goes and takes care of it. And it was hilarious because he kept hanging the towels up and they fell down about three times. (laughs) Houston, he comes up. I'm like, he goes and takes care of it, you know. Uh, uh, But how many times do I have to tell you? You know what it does? It takes time. It takes time. And it's probably going to take time until they're out and they have their own. And somehow it just transfers. There's like a a rite of passage to having your own kid. (laughs) Man, I, if the Lord tarries, I cannot wait. <laughs> uh, uh, that'll be hilarious just to watch. Um, uh, it takes time to rear kids. It takes time to have a good marriage. It's good. Oh, the honeymoon. Life is so wonderful. We get along. We're so in love. Yeah, until you find out she's not as clean as you thought she was. She throws her clothes in the corner. She has a day in which she does dishes and not like, hey, just do the dishes Once a day, and we'll always have clean dishes. Once a month, and I'm not saying my wife does. I'm not, no, I'm not saying my wife does. Once a month, we do laundry. We we currently are in the borrowing a washer and dryer mode, and I walked into the boys' uh, room, and there are, it looks like um, Everest and the, uh, the, the, the Rockies and the Andes Mountains with clothes. I'm like, what is going on in here? Um, and, and immediately they wanted to blame Grandma Jackson. She said she'd do our laundry. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, okay. It's, but it takes time to develop a good marriage. And I mean good, I mean lasting. A lasting marriage. It takes time to do these things. And if you're not working on strengthening your marriage and being a parent and your walk with God, if it's not strengthening It's stagnant, and if it's stagnant, it's going to decay, and if it decays or weakens, it's something that is going to die. So your marriage, so to speak, is not going to be wonderful by accident. It's something that is worked towards. You've got to be working on your marriage, on your child rearing, on your walk with God, on your your talents. So um, it's... uh, Let's, let's finish with this. 
Quit trying to hurry up and read your Bible. Quit trying to hurry up and read it. Uh, when I was a kid, before I really understood, and I, and I heard a lot of preaching on it, I grew up in it, and I, I, the only reason why I can say um, uh, that I caught on eventually is because I stayed in church, because I heard it repetitively over and over again, and I developed a walk with God, a relationship with God, where when I was a kid, I would say, okay, the goal is to read the Bible through. I read, and, and sometimes in the summer, I'd read 60 chapters, 30 chapters, 40 chapters. There were times in Bible time or family devotions that we'd have where, um, you know, we'd have, we'd have um, like, questions. Dad would say, okay, who was, what was, when, where was, and he'd give a situational question. And he'd always ask a stumper, because I mean, we'd get on it. Teresa and Ben and Sarah and Jesse, myself and Jamal, we'd be like, yes, this, da, 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 da. And Dad would be like, okay, okay, I got to give you something hard. Ah, and he tried to give us a stumper, and every once in a while, I could be able to I'd answer one of those things. One time, I recall specifically, we had this big pocket door. If you guys have been to the Elmwood house, you'd remember you walk in, staircase, and then a front door here. You walk in the front door to the right there, and then you had your big living room, and there was a pocket door that separated the dining room and the living room. And we were all sitting there, kind of uh, uh, within a few feet. There was a, a built-in bookshelf, oval bookshelf. It's where we kept all our encyclopedias that we all read through. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we'd sit there, you know, and dad asked, he said, okay, I'm going to give you a stumper. How many chapters in Lamentations and how many verses in each chapter? And lo and behold, I had just read it the day before. I'm like, yeah. Dad's like a stumper. He's like, if, I, if, you, if anybody can get this, I'll buy pizza tonight. Hallelujah. It was divine. It was a divine meeting. Amen. Five chapters, I think. And there's 30, if I recall, 33 verses in each chapter. Besides chapter three, there's like 66 or 65 verses. And he said, and I said, and I, but I knew it uh, uh, to the number. And um, I mean, I nailed it. And, he, and I raised my hand. He's like, you don't know. I'm like, yes, I do know. I know. He's like, no, you don't. I'm like, yeah, I do. So we answered it. He said, no, he got a Bible, opened it up. He had to double check. He's like, oh, now he's got to buy pizza. And I, man, I devour the Bible. And, but I didn't, I can't tell you anything. I can't tell you. Man, this one time I was reading the Bible and Shekinah, Shekinah glory opened the windows of heaven and poured out such a significant blessing to my 11-year-old brain. No, you know what my 11-year-old brain was geared for? Mom said, dad said, teacher said. You know, there's really only a couple of commandments that are geared toward children in the Bible, but the main one is children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. I want to obey mom and dad because that's what I was told to do. Because mom and dad are supposed to know the Bible, read the Bible, study the Bible, obey the Bible, teach the children also. Children obey mom and dad. Children are inevitably blessed and used of God because they're obeying mom and dad who are obeying the Bible. Amen. Did you follow along with that? If you didn't, play it back on YouTube later from, with Brother Alex posting it. But uh, I want to hurry up and read through the Bible. No, I want to hurry up and, and be blessed by the Bible. I want to hurry up and, and, and get something from the Bible. I'll tell you this, just enjoy reading your Bible. Quit trying to hurry up, hurry up. Uh, uh, and I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. Uh, uh, but if she would just quit taking so long to tell the story, uh, I, Jamie's talking and I'm like, oh, walk with me. I've got some, I got to uh, quit trying to hurry up and talk to your spouse. Slow down and listen to him. Even though as torturous it may be sometimes. <laughs> Jamie's going to knock me. Hey, hey, what are you saying? Don't justify yourself up there. I want you to hit the altar tonight. Ask God to forgive you. Quit trying, <laughs> quit trying to hurry up through life. Quit trying to hurry up and rear your kids. It takes time. It takes time. So quit trying to rush the valuable things in life. Things that are valuable, don't rush them. They take time. Um, uh, uh, so I, I said it earlier this afternoon, and, and um, um, it feels weird to say this, but it is what it is. In our staff meeting, um, uh, our, our faculty meeting, I should say, faculty, finances, and facilities, amen? Three emphases for this year. Um, uh, but uh, our staff and faculty this week, um, uh, I talked about being able to um, cram. I've always been good at cramming in information right before a test. 
Dr. Pohazi, I was never one to say, oh, the teacher said or the professor said we, we need to have this done by the end of the month and that's in three weeks. Well, I'm going to portion out this time every week. No, I was always like, man, we got, that's tomorrow? Oh man, let's cram that in real quick. Let me cram that in. Uh, and, and just jam it all in and go into, go into the classroom with a Red Bull in my hand and my eyes wide open going, all right, let's get this over. The ink on my palm is starting to wear off. <laughs> but cram, 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 cram. Folks, it may work every once in a while and work for a test or a quiz here and there, but you cannot, it will not work throughout your life. It will catch up to you. It will catch up. So what we do is we begin to develop, and I'm done. We develop patterns in life by the principles of the Bible to live by. That builds your wall. That gives longevity. That gives consistency. And that gives security. Living by principles. Because even if the world points at you and calls you, uh, I don't call anybody square anymore. They have a lot more filthy, raunchy, derogatory names for people who try to live right and do right. But if you try to live right and do right, and the world may point their finger at you and call you some name or laugh at you, God did not laugh. God pumped his fist and said, yeah. And I'd rather have God say, boy, well done, than the world come and, and give me everything they have. I had uh, that understanding. I saw a man, you may be familiar with the name, uh, he was, he's an Irish MMA fighter. His name is Conor McGregor. When he first, became on the, first came on the scene, I thought, uh, man, this guy's a madman. He's fierce. I like this guy. He's crazy. But then he, he talked, um, he uh, basically said if he got in a fight with Jesus Christ, he'd kick his, what an, uh, what an idiot. What a stupid, prideful, stinking, moronic fool. And by the way, his career quick, quickly went, mm. not saying not saying it was a coincidence or anything, but the guy was on top of every, and by the way, he's still got millions. He's still popular. He's still training to fight again, I, but, and I don't care. But the thing is, is I saw a picture of him, and he was on a, at a beach house surrounded by all these exotic cars, a big, beautiful, million-dollar, multi-million-dollar home, and he was doing this. Like, I have arrived. Look at me. Bro, you're one of millions and millions and millions. You're not special. And by the way, he kicked my rear end physically. He's a madman. He's 180 pounds. I think he's put on a bunch of weight. He, right, yeah. I got a couple of guys named, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, got, I have a couple of people who'd back me up. Well, I have a couple of um, inanimate objects who are there for protection. Uh, but, um, and by the way, I, 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 it would be wonderful if Mr. McGregor, if somebody who had an influence on that life knew the gospel and was able to share it with him, and he got saved because Jesus would save him too. Jesus would save him right where he is, right how he is. That guy doesn't have to die and go to hell. He doesn't have to. And you say, well, how do you know he's dying and going to hell? Because a saved man wouldn't say that about Jesus. I said, a saved man, well, I know so-and-so, and they said they were saved. No, they're not. Saved people wouldn't say that about Jesus Christ. I don't care how backslidden they are. Don't care. Uh, uh, and I don't care if it was a family member of mine who said it. Then you're not saved. Look, come here, come forward today. Let's get you saved right now. Well, anyway. Here he is. I have arrived. You haven't arrived. You've, you, you've arrived at the, not even the top of humanity. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Because I guarantee you, uh, any one of those people, all these famous people, stand before the Lord and go, Lord, I'll give you my multi-million dollar house. I'll give you all my cars. I'll give you everything that I have. And the Lord says, it's not yours anyway. The lumber it took and the steel and the iron and the copper and the wiring and all the things that it took to build that house, that's mine anyway. You built that house. You bought that house with my stuff. The life you lived for yourself, that was my oxygen you were breathing. Those were, the, all that energy that you had, that was my energy. I just let you have it. I just let you use it. It's mine. So folks, let's not get sucked into this, this very convincing, very appealing a uh, uh, culture lifestyle where we have to have and go and do and, and think and dress and wear and drive and live to feel like we have some sort of value. Get that out of your mind. You say, okay, Brother Jake, I agree with you. I'm in step with you. I'm content with the things that I have and 
of course, I'd like to have better or whatever the case, and, 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 and that'll work itself out. But I want to live for the Lord. How do I do it? Principle. But living by principle takes time. Takes time. Uh, I leave tonight for Phoenix. You know what it's going to take to get out there? Time. Patience. I can't wait. I cannot wait to get into Oklahoma. You say, why? Just right, right, in, right outside east of Tulsa, it turns into 75 miles an hour. Yeah, baby. And then for, for, for uh, once you get past Oklahoma City, to Oklahoma City, right past it, turns into 80 mile an hour. Now, I can't do 80. And my truck will run 75. But it is, uh, it's not healthy for a vehicle to run it at full MPH for hundreds or thousands of miles. It's not, it's not good for it. So you just, I'll back it down to 73. That's better than 65, amen. Come on, Indiana, get with it. Uh, but um, I'll run it at 73, but it's gonna take time. It's gonna take patience, but I will arrive at my destination, God willing. And the same thing for you. We want to stand before the Lord and hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. We want to earn and, and receive, man, I've went way too long, I, and receive the blessings for the Lord. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. Gear your mind tonight. I'll get into this next week about trying to gear our minds, slow down our minds, fast-paced microwave society that we live in, but not with the Lord. The Lord's about longevity, not heating it up for 30 seconds and having instant popcorn. Uh, Two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, uh, but um, uh, it's the longevity. Are you in it for the long run? Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for these people here. Oh, Lord, it, it is appealing. I got to tell you, Lord, the, the world does glit and, and glimmer. It has its appeal. It has its, it, its attraction and its allurement. Uh, sometimes it sounds right and smells right and Man, the world and the and and the 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 devil, they know how to give a sales pitch because they know what appeals to our flesh. And many times we give in because we fed the flesh and not the spirit. Lord, I'd ask that you you'd be with us this week. Help us to start investing in the things that are valuable and principles, biblical principles are valuable in the things that make us rich toward God living by principle. Oh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us to do that. And then, Lord, if we have uh, unconfessed sin from the youngest in here to the oldest, if we we've, if we've, uh, have something in the way that we've not brought to you and said, Lord, I did this, would you forgive me? Would you help me? Would you help me to do better? Lord, I'd ask that people would do that one-on-one. -on -one. I, as a pastor, pray for our people as a whole tonight, but, Lord, I ask that this is a... a uh, uh, opening the door for people to come to you individually and say, Lord, forgive me and help me. Help me to do better. Help me to live for you and love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Jennifer. <laughs>